everybody. My name is Yona Lunsky, and I'm the director of the Azraeli Adult Neurodevelopmental Center here at CAMH. And um, every month or so, we try to have a little bit of a webinar um, on a topical sort of um, issue that um, people are thinking about for families, especially families of adults with developmental disabilities. And we invite really smart, interesting people to have these dialogues with us. So I am really happy that I get to invite Yolanda Neal to join us again um, because she just did uh, some fantastic uh, work in this area, really across the whole pandemic, um, and also a really clear um, uh, uh, chat with me in the wintertime. So Yolanda, do you want to introduce yourself and just say kind of what you do and why this is important for you? Yeah, hello, I'm Yolanda Neal. I'm a family physician and I um, part of my practice is focused on the care of adults with intellectual disabilities. So I work at a community health center in Scarborough called Scarborough Center for Healthy Communities. And I also uh, work at a group home in Markham. Um, with, we have a lot of adults with intellectual disability and cerebral palsy there. Um, and so uh, I've also had uh, a lot of uh, fun work with Yona and her team through um, the, uh, uh, the Project ECHO where we're teaching other um, healthcare providers and developmental service workers about um, coping with COVID. Thanks, Yolanda. So how things are gonna go today is we will take up to an hour, it might be a bit less, um, just chatting about uh, different kinds of questions or things people are thinking about as we're getting ready for summer. Um, in some ways, it's a time of optimism and hope. The days are getting longer, warmer, um, vaccines are uh, out there as a, a real sort of um, uh, way for us to move forward um, and uh, things are going to change and, and change is good. Sometimes change is anxiety provoking. So we're going to talk about some of the sort of good things and the more difficult things happening now and sort of get your perspective. I think Yolanda as a family doctor who's been, you know, involved with some people and their families, uh, you know, across the pandemic, but what sort of is important for you and, and what your take is on these things. So um, mm -hmm. I'm going to get started throwing questions at you. Um, I, a lot of the questions, uh, even though vaccines have been out for a while, I have to say, I think sometimes the information on them isn't always quite as clear as it can be. Or sometimes you hear information from one group, but then you hear information from other people and it might be a little bit confusing. Um, so I wondered kind of if you wanted to talk a little bit about you know, what are what are the vaccines that are being distributed right now? So we've announced that we can give vaccines as of today, second shots to 80 year olds and also vaccines to kids 12 and up. What are they getting? What's the difference? Does it matter? Should we be looking for certain vaccines? So what what do you have to say about that stuff? So um, the first two vaccines that were approved were uh, mRNA type vaccines. Um, they're uh, Pfizer vaccine and Moderna. Um, and those are brand new technology. Um, they give your body uh, instructions on how to make a little piece of the uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, virus, and then your, ant your body will create antibodies. They're really amazing vaccines. They work uh, very well at preventing infection, as well as preventing serious illness, hospitalization, and ICU time. Um, and so, um, when those first came out, everyone was very excited, um, but we had shortages, right? And it was a, a bit of a difficult um, time for everyone because we were all stressed about when we were going to get our vaccine. Um, later, uh, AstraZeneca vaccine was uh, released. Um, it's more of a traditional vaccine. It uses a viral vector, um, so a virus that's common called adenovirus, and that virus will take the instructions to make a little piece of the COVID-19 virus into your body cell. So it's a little bit different. It's, that's how most vaccines work that we have out in distribution right now. Um, so uh, it, it's, um, it's also a good vaccine. Uh, it uh, works well to prevent um, hospitalization, ICU time and things like that but it is not as effective at preventing getting the infection. I mean, the numbers are not terrible, but um, overall, the if you take the AstraZeneca vaccine, you might still get COVID-19, but you wouldn't get very sick is the, the key. Um, the AstraZeneca vaccine has also been in the news because um, a rare side effect was identified with that vaccine. 
um, the numbers are really quite low, um, but it still gave people pause. And um, uh, then a lot of different recommendations were coming out about it, and it made it confusing for some people about whether to take it or not, right? Um, overall, I think um, I think the the recommendation from the government is correct that the best shot to take is the the first shot that you can get, um, and that I don't think that um, it's it's I I still recommend the AstraZeneca vaccine to my friends and family, for example. Um, so uh, also just another note is that the for children um, the only vaccine that is um, currently approved is the Pfizer. Uh, they are the ones who have completed all of their studies. I think Moderna will come out soon with their research, and um, I hear that in the fall we might even hear research for children six and up. Right, so things are really moving, which is really exciting. But I think people still get kind of confused sometimes, and I saw some questions from families about what are we sort of allowed to do after one vaccine? You know, is it safe for us to be you know, my loved one really wants to go out and see other people. They've been vaccinated. We've all been vaccinated once. You know, what would be okay? What still isn't okay? Right. So um, I think when I'm thinking about deciding on the risk, um, you have to think about um, a number of factors. First of all, who else is vaccinated? Um, what's the vaccine rate in your, um, in your local area? Um, and uh, the prevalence of infection in your area? Um, as well as um, like the what's the circumstances of your interaction, like where where are you going to be? Um, so, for example, uh, you have to think about the vaccines and their effectiveness at different time points. Um, when you first take an mRNA vaccine like Pfizer or Moderna, um, it takes two weeks for the first shot to um, to work. So um, after two weeks, you're considered partially vaccinated. For those mRNA vaccines, um, real world, world studies are showing that um, you are between 44% and 90% vaccinated. Why is it such a large range? Um, it's because um, they've found that people who are older or have weaker immune systems might not have as good a response. And also, um, some of the studies are from different places. A lot of, there's quite a bit of research coming from Israel. There's some from Canada, so, and they're different size studies. So they're not all coming out with the exact same number, but it is showing that although you are vaccinated, you're not you're not 100%, especially after the first dose. Um, and when I say effectiveness, I mean prevention of getting a COVID-19 infection. And so we already know that the mRNA vaccines like Pfizer and Moderna are a little bit better at preventing um, getting COVID-19. Um, and so uh, also the AstraZeneca number would be a little bit lower. Um, you're considered fully vaccinated about a week after receiving your second dose. So um, all of, um, the majority of the population right now is kind of in a limbo situation where they've had the the two weeks of the first dose, um, but they're not yet at the at the second dose. A week after the second dose for the uh, Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, you'll be at about 90% um, chance, 90% um, um, less likely to get a COVID-19 infection, and um, for AstraZeneca, you're at 60% uh, less likely to get infection. Um, but you have to remember that all of the vaccines reduce your hospital admissions and ICU time. So um, uh, this, is, this is, it's still promising. I guess that's one part that's really confusing for people. So like if you, for example, some people, um, you know, asked us about if they have a loved one who lives in a group home kind of setting and they've been vaccinated and staff have been vaccinated you know, why are they still saying they're an outbreak? How can that happen, right? So what's the difference between having an outbreak and knowing that the vaccine is working? Um, so th because none of these numbers are 100%, right? Um, there's still a chance that someone could get COVID-19 and still there's still a chance that someone could get quite ill. So the numbers uh, are very good, but they're not perfect. And so we still have to be careful. 
And if we are able to reduce our risk with some of our other behaviors and use vaccines to help um, uh, reduce the chance of getting an infection, then, then we put ourselves in a really safe place. Um, someone was asking in the chat about um, the numbers. They said, is it 97% and 90% after a week? Oh, so the numbers are, sorry, I will look at my paper so I don't say it wrong. Um, for after, the, after two weeks of uh, the first vaccine, the numbers are between 44% and 90% effective. And then after the um, after a week after the uh, the second shot, you're ninety percent effective. And um, the numbers are not exactly the same as you might have seen from um, the original studies because these this is from the real world data. So this is um, actually studying people who are out in the population who may be experiencing variants and other things. Whereas in the original studies for Pfizer and Moderna, they came up 97% when they studied it um, in the, the first batch of people. I it's mean, really, that's, number, that's pretty close. Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, it's a really important point, isn't it, that we're studying this as it's happening, right? So we did studies early on, and that would be related to how much COVID was in those communities at that time. And then if you do a study in the winter, it's going to be based on what's going on in that community where it's being studied at that time, right? So um, we're going to continue to learn, I think. But it sounds like the message is pretty consistent. The two vaccines are really going to help most people not get ill at all, even if uh, COVID is in their community. But I guess if you live in like a group home or something, even if most people are not going to get very sick, if COVID comes back into that group home setting, you still have to follow those outbreak kinds of rules because you're really trying to prevent spread. So people are not going to be protected until they can get both of those vaccines. So, and the other thing I want to say, I know there's going to be, we may have time to answer all of these questions around the vaccine. Um, and I've seen a lot of numbers being thrown around from different people. You know, is it 80%? Is it 97%? And we can get a little bit caught up, I think, sometimes, Yolanda, with the numbers game and trying to figure out those pieces. So we can talk about it a little bit, um, but I think what's really going to be important is trying to be able to share some links for people that would be helpful so they can learn more about the different vaccines. Um, yeah, but I do want to echo what you said about uh, that. The important thing is the vaccine that you can get um, soonest is going to be really important for a lot of people. Um, but uh, but it is helpful, especially I think with all the news around AstraZeneca to understand what those risks are uh, to make those kinds of decisions. For sure. Right. Yeah. And and, and yes, one a person in the chat asked you. So after my first dose, could I still infect someone else? And the actual, the answer is yes. Um, you're less likely to do so, right? But um, it is still possible. Um, so I guess the the next question is, what can you do to minimize that kind of risk, right? Um, so when I think about it, I think of the, all the things that we've been doing now for a year, right? We we understand that um, there are some settings where you're less likely to transmit COVID. Um, so, for example, being outdoors, um, uh, keeping distance when possible, um, wearing masks if you're indoors or in poorly ventilated spaces, or if you have to be close together, um, and continuing with hand washing, and of course, staying home if you're not feeling well. And uh, I think for some people, they they just kind of want to get rid of the mask. <laughs> we got to move on, right? Because we've done our vaccine, aren't we? Is this over? <laughs> in a way, um, it, we'll have to start thinking about it. In um, we have to start weighing our risk, right? We have to start weighing each individual risk and. So some group homes might be more um, worried about risk and have more strict rules. And other places might say, you know, um, we're weighing the risk. We see that people uh, don't tolerate masks well, and we're going to not use masks. So it just, it's going to depend on allowing the group homes a chance to weigh those risks and make a decision for themselves. And then personally, in your home or when you have people visiting in the backyard, you're going to have to make a decision about what risks are acceptable to you. I think that's a really good point that um, it does sort of come back to us and what we're comfortable with. I'm seeing some questions that are talking about sort of how we deal with what it means when we go back into the community, and we're going to talk about that in just a moment. 
but I just want to finish through that vaccine thread. So um, two questions I can hear. What happens right now when we have staff, maybe um, for people again, who have loved ones who are in uh, residential supported settings, if the staff haven't been vaccinated, but the families have and how we sort of deal with those kinds of risks and things like that. Right. So there's not much we can do personally for to, to have staff vaccinated. It's, it's really a personal choice about being vaccinated. Although, you know, this person is putting themselves at risk, unfortunately, if they're not able to, if they don't, if they choose not to get the vaccine, if they're not able to get the vaccine for other reasons, there's not much anyone can do. Um, so uh, again, they, they have to, can, of course, adhere to the public health guidelines as, as, as strict as possible. So masks, face shields, like all the PPE that they can wear and, um, and all the, everything that they need to do to continue to be careful, um, just as we've been doing all along. It makes me think, Yolanda, you know, we talk about whether it's a staff who hasn't been vaccinated or a family member or a close friend or even someone we love with a disability. Kind of looking at that difference between people who like don't want to get the vaccine versus people who haven't been able to get the vaccine. And I think that kind of mm -hmm. understanding of all the things that go into getting vaccinated, because frankly, it can be kind of complicated, daunting, scary, difficult to figure out, I think, especially for people with disabilities, especially when the information can be a bit confusing or when it's not clear, you know, how accessible vaccines can be. And this week, for those of you who don't know, is Accessibility Week nationally. And we're supposed to be talking about, you know, ways to make our communities as accessible as possible. I don't think the vaccine rollout has been as accessible. It hasn't been as quick as it could have been for our community. And also it's not easy for everyone to get vaccinated. So people might have questions about how they can, um, um, how they can sort of make vaccines happen for their loved one or for themselves. Um, and we have some resources, I think, around that that we can share, but I don't know if you had any comments you wanted to make about that, Yolanda. Right, well, um, this is this is the area where I started thinking of resources. They just turn popping up, right? But um, the, mo the main thing I thought about was think putting it into different categories. So. First of all, what can um, we do as our, on our own to prepare, like as um, uh, someone, who, like a caregiver or a person with a disability, how would, how would we prepare? And um, there are a lot of resources for that. Um, HCARD has um, got quite a few things. I think we have a link for that. We also have um, the Getting Ready for My Shot, which has um, some really great resources. On HCARD, the one I mentioned before, they have some um, nice, simple read explanations about vaccines. There's also social stories. Um, and I think um, you mentioned that there was a, um, some videos that showed um, people like their, their story of how they re received their vaccine, which is uh, good in many ways. First of all, it can help uh, just to normalize the whole situation, but also to give some uh, inspiration of how to make the vaccine appointment work, right? Um, and so after preparing ourselves and our loved one, um, next is to uh, start researching what is available. Um, I think a lot of us have gotten quite savvy at figuring out what's going on in our community with regards to vaccines, but it's good to remind ourselves what's available there. Are pharmacies, sometimes family doctor's offices have the vaccine. Um, there's the government clinics as well as hospital clinics that are all um, appointment based. And then there are pop-up clinics in uh, usually in um, areas of high prevalence that have um, that have uh, sometimes appointments and sometimes it's uh, just you know uh, first come first serve kind of lineup. Um, and then there's also sometimes drive-through clinics. So uh, trying to figure out if you can get into one of those that is more uh, useful for you is really important too. So once you've quite figured out the optimal setting um, and you've kind of researched it as much as you could, maybe ask other people who've been there, what was it like? Um, because um, personally, I always imagined, for example, all the pop-up clinics where you see on the news with the big long lineup, I always think, oh, that's gonna be terrible. That's not gonna work, especially for my patients with intellectual disability. But every now and again, I hear a story where someone says, actually, um, it wasn't that bad. They recognize someone in the line, they move them to, to the front or they um, they don't make you wait in line, they give you a ticket number and then you just come back. 
Um, I've also heard of people saying, oh, I wonder about that mass back clinic. It's going to be crazy. I can't go there. But um, then they realize that the appointments are spaced apart and they have a lot of space. And so it's actually not that bad. And it's, you're not really encountering very many people at all while you're going through. So um, finding out a little bit more, a little spy work <laughs> will be good. Um, you can also call the clinics if possible to ask some questions, um, maybe to find out what kind of accommodations they can make for you. Um, examples of accommodations might be having a quiet space to wait, um, uh, being able to move to the front of the line instead of waiting in line to check in, for example, um, being allowed to bring support items, maybe your iPad or you know, something that is comforting, um, and um, also maybe exemptions from wearing a mask if needed. Thanks, those are all great ideas, Yolanda, and we'll make sure um, after today, the same way we uh, reached out to you in terms of registering for the talk, we'll, we'll share a lot of links and we'll include the ready for my shot um, sort of uh, handout that was put together with Surrey Place, really lists a lot of these kinds of examples of things you can ask for or think about um, in preparing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when I talk about this pandemic, I feel like it's a sort of competition but it's like we're focusing so much on being safe but at the same time we also have to focus on being well you know so we've talked a lot about safe vaccines all about safe right how do we keep people as safe as possible from getting sick but we also need to keep them well and i think people are worried and we saw this in a lot of the questions that came from families people are worried about how their loved ones are coping you know just because things are opening up and we go oh opening up yay that's good that doesn't mean it's easy right it's still change I think people are really scared about that. So I wondered if we could talk a bit about how do we help our loved ones um, if they've become so anxious about being with people at all, and now the floodgates are gonna open, like what's it gonna be like out there? How are they gonna manage? How do we support them? Yeah, well, I think for me, the first thing is to recognize that that's sort of a normal response. For myself, I'm even thinking about, if someone said, do you wanna go to the movies? I don't know. <laughs> I don't want to sit inside with a whole bunch of people. And um, I think there are a lot of things that are going to feel stressful that didn't feel stressful before um, for everyone. And um, we have to also understand that everyone has a different tolerance for risk. And um, we need to also kind of support our loved ones who have a different risk tolerance, right? Um, some people are going to jump right back into society and others are going to have to take some time. And um, uh, just, I think, taking it one step at a time, allowing people a chance to um, connect with small groups of people that they know and love first, and then slowly branching out. Uh, I don't think it's possible to just push someone into the deep end right away. Um, and I've also heard a lot of people saying, um, I've noticed that you know skills that my loved one had are now um, not as good or, um, you know, because a lot of the programs have, were not open or people had to do things digitally that it's, not, it's just not the same as being in person. Um, but uh, just as it took time to build those skills, it will take time to rebuild. Um, so I think being patient and allowing everyone a chance to, to move forward is, is the most important thing. And remembering also that um, we make so many changes. Um, people have learned different skills, new things that um, we might not value or recognize right this minute, but if we look back and think about it, say, wow, I, I never imagined that you would be able to uh, open an, a Zoom talk or, <laughs> you know, uh, connect with someone on the telephone the way you're doing now. So um, there are some, some upsides. Yeah, I think certainly this idea land of kind of growth, right? And that, you know, everyone was forced, you know, it was the worst way delivered possible. Everyone was forced to suddenly have to learn things last spring, right? And that was really difficult. This time we're not forced to suddenly learn things differently. We get to learn them at a bit of our own pace. And we also have, you know, all that experience of seeing how people learned over the last year to use, to think about in terms of how we help support people as we make these next changes. One thing I was thinking of from when you were speaking is that, 
you know, we have different distress levels, different tolerance levels, right? And there might be a situation, like you said, where my loved one, like my sister, for example, let's imagine she's really scared about things and I'm a bit less scared because I understand the science better. That's one way it could be. And the other way it could be is my sister's like, all right, let's go. But I'm still scared, right? So either way, we're two people interacting who have different tolerances. Um, and we have to recognize when they're not the same. It can even be like with anyone in our family, whether they have a disability or not, right? But giving this space, recognizing that people are going to adjust differently, I think is really important. And understanding our own feelings about stuff and how that compares with or is different maybe than our loved one who has a disability, I think is an important piece too. Yeah, so I, I'm sort of, I feel like thinking about it as sort of a rebuilding, right? And um, as we're rebuilding, looking back and saying, what has happened over the past year or so that has been positive that I want to keep? Um, and what things do I envision um, to, to kind of get back to the way it was before or um, even better? Um, and how can I get the correct support to make that happen? Um, so it's, a, I don't know, I just, I'm thinking of it as a really hopeful time because we have, we're kind of, we starting from not scratch, but like you're starting from a new place. So you have the opportunity to look back and say, hmm, you know, actually, um, since we didn't have to drive across the city to get to our day program every day, um, we've had a lot more time together. Things have actually been a lot better. You're not as tired. I'm not as tired and everyone's much happier. Maybe we can find a way to reduce the number of times we go across the city or um, and, and change up our programming or, you know, something along those lines. Yeah, I think importantly that we take some time in this sort of as we're getting ready for what's going to happen next to think about what are the things we want to keep. Right, because um, mm -hmm. there may be it may just be one aspect of how many activities are going on, for example, or how we start our day or something really special, a new ritual or something we developed. That maybe we don't want to lose right away. Right. Um, I think that's really important. I know there's a few questions coming in from people about vaccines, and I think if we have time, we'll come back to the vaccines. But for the people who are thinking more on the well side and less on the safe side, I think we should stick with this mental health stuff a little bit longer. Um, mm -hmm. I'm thinking, um, recognizing, and this has come up for people, you know, what about supports for people as we're bringing more things on and in and that kind of thing, right? Because there's, you know, we're not as as parents as siblings we're not just like the same all the time right like how we are now a year plus into the pandemic is different than maybe how we were when this all started people are incredibly exhausted right like it's not like oh fresh bushy tailed everything's opening up i feel great you know we're depleted so how do we think about supports and things for our loved ones and for ourselves kind of going forward well, one thing i've noticed um is a lot of people have had kind of a pullback of their supports in some ways, uh, you know, just as a consequence of the pandemic and what was available. So um, that might not be okay. And I think some people have been managing, but um, as we're moving forward, uh, you, you'll have to continue advocating to, to, to get back some of the supports that you need. Um, so for example, if you had someone that was coming four days a week, but then Instead of having two workers and too many people in the house, you, you only have someone come in once a week. That might not be enough and you might need to, to start rebuilding that. Um, I think that's that's the main thing that I noticed. Um, and maybe with that, Yolanda, like going back to the safe from the safe and well side of things, if we're going to have two workers coming in, you know, what's the safest way to interact with them, right? So doing things outdoors, you know, wearing masks, shorter times if it has to be indoors. So as we're starting to open up more and thinking about activities that we wanna keep in mind the things that make everyone feel well enough and how we gradually introduce more routines, but still making sure that we're keeping everyone as safe as possible. Those old rules still apply, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some people talk about things like anxiety. So it could be sort of, worry about being with other people it could be hand washing and like hand washing that isn't just like for the um happy birthday length of time but just kind of non-stop right so what happens what what if it feels like something your loved one is doing is is really too much like they they don't want to get out of bed or try anything anymore or they 
you know, can't stop washing their hands or don't want to be with any people no matter what, even if it's outside, right? We can't even get them to get vaccinated because they refuse to leave the house. So how do we how do we figure out when it's like a really big deal or just like a little COVID adjustment? Right. So you're starting to wonder, is this actually a new or worsening mental health concern compared to um, just a, a small adjustment thing? Um, well, I like to think of it in using a, a certain framework called HELP. So um, we have actually quite a few resources for caregivers about the HELP um, algorithm, but it's, it's a way to evaluate a behavior um, of a person with intellectual disability and see if um, we can um, determine where it's coming from or give us some clues as to what we can do next. Um, so H stands for health. So making sure there are no uh, physical health concerns that have not been addressed. Uh, e is for environment. Um, so where they live, what you know, circumstances of their day-to-day uh, -to -day and the supports they have. L is for lived experience. So um, the past traumas or things that may have uh, contributed to how they're behaving now. And, and with COVID, of course, there are, are quite a few new things that can be added to the lived experience, right? You know, suddenly being apart from loved ones or having to wear masks and things like that. Um, uh, and then um, P is actual psychiatric concerns like anxiety or um, obsessive compulsive disorder or OCD. Um, so uh, we have to go through the whole thing before we decide if someone has anxiety, for example. And um, uh, what's the best way to do that? I think um, one good way is to connect with your healthcare provider, so like your primary care um, doctor, just to, to see if um, everything has been um, kind of reviewed. And um, if you're lucky enough to be connected with psychiatry, that's also another option. Um, but I recognize that it, it, it's difficult to um, connect with psychiatry. I think there's just not enough of that resource, um, especially where I work. Um, so sometimes starting with your healthcare provider might, might, um, be all you need to do. And, um, and also, um, you can also start collecting some information so that when you go to see that healthcare provider, you have a little bit, of something more to talk about. So you might say, I think they're washing their hands a lot, but if you actually wrote down that actually, uh, he went to wash his hands 15 times. Uh, this morning for the first two hours, that's that's very informative. Um, and there are some kind of, um, you know, structured monitoring tables that you can use, but you can just write down um, the number of times you see something or um, kind of your own observations about different things so that you have something to, uh, that you won't forget about when you get into the busy appointment space. I think it's so important, you know, two messages I take from that. One is, you know, there's lots of work we can do ourselves that helps us to prepare, like whoever we're seeing, the mental health professional only knows so much. And a lot of what they know comes from what we observe and what we share. So the more sort of uh, structured we can be in that, I think the more helpful it's going to be when those appointments happen. But also keeping in mind, like, you know, how many months into the pandemic and now we're going to give you 17 sheets to fill out every day every 15 minutes that's impossible right so yeah. what can what can we do that fits into the day you know that makes sense and even if, if it just means putting a few notes down at the end of the day into a journal and just having that journal when you go to a meeting and i think there are some nice little tick box sheets that capture certain things that are really important but you got to do what you can manage and i think that's yeah. an important yeah. message as well and also uh, you know so sometimes people like i've seen families find these really cool monitoring sheets and then they want to bring it to the group home and say, okay, guys, I need you to do all this monitoring, but it, it could be quite difficult, especially on a busy day. So um, sometimes those, like it's not informative to use the sheet because they might not even be able to fill it out or can do it for one day or something. It, instead, it might be more helpful, like you said, to just jot something down or have a little observation overall of the day um, that can be used. Yeah, no, it's a really good point. And I think also the idea of, you know, like for you also, do you, would you rather write something down that you were told to write down or that you thought of and you gave ideas about? So I think, you know, having meetings sometimes together 
I know I try really hard to do this uh, in my own family with my sister and with her staff to see if we can have regular meetings where we're talking about things as they're starting to emerge and still instead of waiting until it's like really horrible and seeing if we can agree on things that are easy to measure and then also using our healthcare providers to help us kind of interpret or figure out that information. Right, so because there can be sometimes easier ways to do stuff and we just may not know what those things are. So I think that's important. Um, I, I guess the other maybe comment that I'll just make again, sort of working on the mental health side of things is you, you did mention Yolanda that sometimes it is hard to get that sort of specialist that you think knows the most about a condition. But I would say uh, two things about the two groups you mentioned that are a bit easier to access. So you as a parent or a sibling actually have pretty good intuition about a lot of things. You know your loved one pretty darn well, right? So that's really important. And that's sort of a, an expertise I think that only you have. And also I think a family doctor like you, I think if you follow a family over time, you know, we're not just comparing, when we try to figure out if someone has depression right now, we're not just saying, well, do you have these symptoms and does that look like what we call depression? We're also saying, how are you right now? And how's that different than how you were before this happened? Right, so we're always comparing people to themselves. And I think that it might be the family doctor and us as families who know who the person is the best. Right, and that relationship, that knowledge of how things have changed is really, really important when it comes to figuring out and addressing mental health things. And, and, and sometimes progress, like sometimes progress is fast and that's awesome. Sometimes it's some trial and error, you know, um, and it doesn't go quite as quickly, but I think we can make small gains and over time a number of small gains are actually really big gains and it's hard to see it when you're in it you know and then but it's when you step out you look at it i was talking to someone the other day about some issues and um i was trying to recollect things that had happened and i realized oh my gosh i don't actually remember the date of when that happened anymore and i thought how amazing is it that something that was so intense and so important and so hard that i actually don't remember it anymore Right, like sometimes when you step back and things start to change, it doesn't feel quite as intense as it does in that moment, I think, when you're in it, which I found at that moment, besides feeling kind of forgetful, I, I found that like a certain comfort that it wasn't quite as clear for me, but also why it would be important that I had it written down. Because if I saw a specialist now and I had to report all that stuff, it isn't as clear anymore, right? So keeping good notes is important. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, people are writing a lot of comments in here, which I find really helpful about different things. Um, one, one comment that's sticking out for me is this idea of, you know, what is kind of normal, right? What is okay? And, and I think this recognition that what is okay right now, maybe isn't the kind of stuff we would have said was okay 16 months ago, or maybe in six months, we wouldn't say it's okay anymore, right? So what we've sort of considered the norm has been kind of really influenced by everything that's gone on for us, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Our re behavior has changed for everyone, right? And so it's it's we're in a, as they say, uncharted territory. <laughs> um, but uh, if if it doesn't feel right, then it's okay to go and investigate and figure out if there's a way to make it better. Yeah, I think that's important. And sometimes I think because you know, again, if you're in it, you don't necessarily see how much it's changed. So it can be helpful to kind of say, actually, you know what, I think things could be a bit different, or this is how I remember it. Here's, here's, here's actually a picture. You might have like new people who are working with your loved one who didn't really know what they were like before, right? So maybe it's helpful to kind of say, actually, this is a sign that they could do before. Here's a picture, here's a video, whatever. You know, it, we may not get back to those places, all of us, we've all lost things. Um, and we may get somewhere even better, we don't know, right? But it is helpful, I think, to sort of help people recognize um, how things have changed. Um, and also sort of monitoring them moving forward. Mm -hmm. um, we have a bit more time, I think, just to look at some of the specific questions we've talked now about. We've talked about the safe, we've talked about some of the well, and we've talked about that kind of adjustment we're all making right now, but also what to do when something feels like it's maybe more significant. Um, and again, we'll share resources with everyone around some of the more mental health um, type, type things. Um, I wonder, Yolanda, I don't think there's anything from the old questions that we had before today that we haven't really covered. So I wondered if mm -hmm. it would be okay for us to look back at some of these additional questions and things that have popped up. There are a couple of vaccine questions. Sure. Are you ready to go back to some of those? Let's so go one, back. All right. So one question that I saw had to do with, it, with someone with Down syndrome, and that's a really, that's an interesting example of 
a particular kind of intellectual or developmental disability where we do know certain things about it uh, in relation to COVID. Uh, and the question here is if someone's already recovered from an infection and they've had a single dose of the vaccine, is that the same? Could they be considered immunized? Are they done? Um, are we still looking for some kind of booster? So we're still doing the booster, although what you're saying intellectually makes sense, right? They may have had the infection, been sort of primed, and um, the, the first dose could, uh, in, in your mind, be sort of a booster. The only problem is we don't know what kind of immune response they had from that first infection, and um, it, it really has uh, to do with a lot of factors like how sick they got, what their body was doing aside from um, making antibodies, might be, you know, busy fighting the infection um, or, uh, you know, dealing with uh, difficulty breathing and other things. Your body might not be busy making antibodies. Um, and so uh, there's no guarantee that you had an excellent immune response from your first infection. Some people do. And there have been, have been some studies showing that people have had an uh, excellent immune response from their first from having the infection and it's lasting. Um, but we just don't have the research to say that it's safe to just take one dose of the vaccine or not to receive the vaccine if you've been infected. Um, I've also seen uh, people like so. For example, I've worked with quite a few people who've had the infection already, and we're asking uh, at first, should we should we bother with the vaccine? And the answer was definitely a yes. And I do think the answer is definitely yes for the booster as well. Um, and um, also, we the booster is being studied as we go for these new variants. And so um, understanding um, what kind of protection you have for variants that are in your community is really important. And you just you would not know that if you had the infection um, over the past year or so. It's a really good point. And I guess the other point here is, um, we know that in terms of immune responses for people with Down syndrome, but it doesn't work quite the same as it will for someone of the same age who doesn't have Down syndrome. So the same is, I mean, one reason why we're vaccinating our 80 year olds right now um, and not waiting any longer has to do with the fact that their immune response works a bit differently, right? And that so um, I think for people with Down syndrome as well, we really do need to make sure um, that um, because it, it can be harder for them to fight infections. Um, that they're getting both of their vaccines, even if they've had COVID before. I guess the other challenge, unfortunately, is when we do our research, we don't have, certainly in Canada, we don't have a whole bunch of big studies going on around Down syndrome and COVID, right? We have to look. I think one of the good things about the pandemic is we figured out how to look better and faster across the world to learn our information. So we can learn really important things about Down syndrome and COVID from international research that's been happening. But um, we don't have as much of that research happening for people with disabilities as we do for people without. So I think with unknowns, we want to be safe, right? And we want to make sure that we're keeping this group safe, um, given that we know that they have worse outcomes or that they have had worse outcomes so far during the pandemic. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We did get another question as well about that sort of vaccine mixing. Can you remind us, Yolanda, where things are at right now around if we had Moderna first time, can we have Pfizer second time? Does it matter? Um, so far, um, they're re recommending you stick with the same uh, vaccine that you received. Although, um, uh, you know, because AstraZeneca, they're still not sure what's going to happen with the future of that vaccine. I think um, there are uh, the government and um, Health Canada is awaiting anxiously the results of um, some studies that are going on right now in the UK, the big studies. Uh, to see what happens with vaccine mixing. So if you receive, for example, AstraZeneca first and get Pfizer next, how, what kind of immunity do you get and what's the safety behind it? So far, the safety data has been good, so it's considered safe, but we just don't know how effective it is. So um, just waiting for the final word on that. There have been some small studies showing effectiveness, but um, everyone just wants to see the, the big, the big, big one. Um, so, so for now, um, the recommendation is to continue with your current vaccine, um, and then we'll see what happens in the future. Yeah. We did get some questions around why it's taking so long, and I know you don't work in government and neither do I, but I don't want to ignore that question. I think, yeah. um, you know, certainly uh, we're advocating, we recognize that, you know, we needed to get the vaccines to start early the first time for anyone who was following the Ready for My Shot campaign. I've been talking more recently about Ready for My Shot 2, 
So depending on where you're joining us from today, I know in BC, um, all people with development disabilities who use services there in adulthood have been able to register for their second vaccine. Um, and also in uh, Manitoba, we've seen that for people who are in group home settings or people who have Down syndrome. So our rules, again, are different depending on where we live. Um, but we haven't really heard anything yet in Ontario um, about when people with development disabilities can get their second vaccine in other provinces. And I think that's a really important thing for us to keep advocating for. Um, yeah, I think it's just it's become a um, something where uh, we had to advocate and talk about the mo most recent research, and I feel like it's kind of a shame that um, uh, it had to become a push from the from the populace instead of um, the, the the researchers themselves and people who are providing the, the uh, guidance to the government from the very beginning. Um, but initially, uh, to be fair, I guess there wasn't as much data. Um, about people with intellectual disability and um, and their risk of severe illness or disease at the very beginning. But as time went on and more information came about, um, I was hopeful that some of the recommendations from the top would change, um, but they but they didn't. Yeah, I think that feels familiar for some of us who've grown up in the sector, eh? Like that's a familiar thing that happens sometimes where things don't change as quickly as they should, but I don't know, an accessibility week, you know, I think it's something for us to really keep pushing for. And and one thing I've found comforting, I don't know about other people, but I feel less alone in my advocating now than I did, I think, before the pandemic. I feel like we have a collective voice. Um, we're learning quickly from each other. We're working together to make things change. I have seen some changes, like with examples of um, making sure people did get recognized for the vaccine uh, distribution here. And, uh, you know, I'm hopeful that this sort of collective way of us coming together, even virtually, even like this, just having this conversation, that we can make things like this more accessible, more often for people um, to help people, I think, moving into the future. And, 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 you know, three cheers for science. Like, I hope, I don't know how many of you have been approached about research studies, how many of you have been part of our research studies, but Unfortunately, we can't drive decision making without evidence. And um, one policymaker said a long time ago something about how if you can't add up all the stories and turn them into numbers, right? You kind of need to actually collect the numbers and do the research to go with the stories, I think, to bring about change. So it is important that we're included in research studies and that we participate in them if we can. Um, and I hope so much we learn lessons from this pandemic about how to make things better moving forward into the future. Um, I don't know if you have any final words or thoughts, Yolanda. We've been speaking for a while now, covered a lot of ground. I think I'm so appreciative of all the things you've said. Well, I think uh, I I think for me, um, what's different from the last time that we chatted is that uh, this to me, I'm, I'm even more hopeful. So last time I was hopeful because vaccines were on the horizon. Now it's it's actually happening, and um, the the conversation we've had today is about is about returning to um, like our, our lives. And so I'm excited about it. And I think hopefully everyone um, has has a chance to feel a little bit of that, that joy and hopefulness in the next few weeks. Thank you. Thank you so much for giving your time today. Thanks everyone who joined us today. Thank you for your valuable questions and input. We always want to hear more from you. If there's a resource you think should be out there and we can't find it for you, please tell us what it is. We'll try to create it. Uh, and I hope we can keep um, connecting uh, and communicating together um, to make the lives of uh, our brothers and our sisters and our kids uh, better. Um, yeah, so be safe and be well, everyone, and enjoy the sunshine and uh, take care. Thanks, Yolanda. No problem.